When the price went from $5 to $50, we had 5 billion ounces of bullion. Didn't stop the price from rising. It may have helped the price fall, but in the aftermath, but it didn't stop the price from rising. And the same is true in gold and in other commodities. For those of you who don't know me, it's strange to be considered a uh, controversial figure because, if anything, I'm sort of like the antithesis of controversy in the markets. I'm going to talk to you today about the real silver market. No fantasy. And I wanted to start by this. This is the real silver market. This is the silver price. And we use monthly averages and quarterly averages, so you'll see that that spike uh, was about $45 a month on a month. It wasn't $49. And you'll see if you look at our longer term charts uh, that we have gold, silver spike, uh, spiking up to something like uh, $20 in 1980 in nominal terms, uh, not 50. Because to catch 50, you have to catch a falling knife. And I've actually caught falling knives, both literally and figuratively in the markets, but it's very hard. So I'm looking at annual prices. But take a look at this. These are monthly prices. This is since 2000. Silver price is pretty high. And the thing you'll notice is it goes up and it goes down. And if you look at other financial markets, you'll see that asset values rise and they fall. That's what happens with financial assets. You know, it's not a factor of a conspiracy. It's a factor of the fact that there isn't a conspiracy. You have to worry, for example, from 2004 to 2010, the oil price consistently rose in a very narrow channel. Well, other things were going up, but in a zigzag basis. The oil price was being managed by OPEC and rising. OPEC knew that if you raise the oil price, it's like putting a lobster in a pot of cold water and turning the heat on, as opposed to throwing them into a hot tub. As long as you keep the oil flowing, and you don't have fuel lines waiting for gasoline at stations, people will pay a higher price for oil. And they did that. That's a managed market. This is not a managed market. And I wanted to start, well, I've got this chart up here. I've got a lot of charts and I guess 50 minutes to go. So let me see what I can do here. I wanted to start by looking at a quote from Carl Jung. He was talking about mental health. And he was saying that to understand your consciousness takes pain. That you cannot reach psychological happiness and fulfillment and understanding of yourself without experiencing turmoil. And he said, I have witnessed people go to absurd lengths to avoid exploring their own souls coming up with all kinds of excuses. But you cannot get to mental health by fantasizing light. You have to bring the darkness into light. And you see that in politics. You see that in economics. You see it in all sorts of things. right? So you have to say to yourself, this is what a market looks like. Now, I have a pretty good track record. These are my intermediate term silver recommendations. Since 1980, December 1980, the price of silver was about $16. December 1st, 1980, I said sell it. Uh, 1982, I said buy it. Sell, buy, buy, buy. 1980 to 2000, about 68% of the time I was telling people, don't buy silver, sell it. Other times, the other 32%, I was saying buy it. And they made a lot of money. 2000, 2001, 2002, I said, okay, buy it. We kept that buy recommendation on until the end of April 2011. And then around 2019, we said buy. If you had bought silver when I said sell it in December 1980, you would be up 58%. If you had just taken my buy recommendations, I don't feel comfortable shorting the market, 
But when you say buy, I'll buy. When you say sell, I'll liquidate my silver, put the money in T-bills, and I'll come back when you say buy. You would have made 6,700% return. If you had gone long when I said go long and gone short when I went short, you would have made 33.8,000% return. You don't do that in a market unless you really know what you're talking about. And there are a lot of people who talk about the economy. And you know what? Some of them have only been in the business for six or eight months. But some of them have been in the business for a long time. Jim Rogers started talking that the economy was going to collapse in the late 1960s. And Paul Soros said, you know, you probably should leave quantum funds. And he's still saying the economy is going to collapse. Gold's going to thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. And it's been more than, what, 50 some odd years. Jim Grant's first issue of the interest rate advisor was in 1981. And the cover story was the treasury market's going to collapse. 40 years later, he's still saying the treasury market's going to collapse. If you're waiting for the treasury market to collapse, you've missed two of the biggest bond market rallies in, the, in history. You've missed two of the biggest stock market rallies in history. Or, as some of our clients say, you know, I listened to Peter or Mike or Max for 40 years, and my kids said, Dad, you're squandering our inheritance. Please, stop. You know, so you got these guys now, and it's very interesting. Oh, yeah, the silver price could go to 50 or 60 or $70 an ounce. I said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Your boss was saying last week it's going to 250 Before that, he was saying 1500 You know, so <laughs> that's the silver market. That's why you listen to me. Let's see if we can do this. This is price seasonality. Seasonality gets overridden by events, so you have to be careful. The last two years, silver prices peaked in August, as did gold, and fell in the last five months of the year, four months of the year. We're concerned that that could happen again this year because of economic uh, factors as well as fundamentals in the gold and silver markets. But seasonally, prior to 2019, 2020, you could expect a modest increase in silver prices in the last four months of the year. We haven't seen it in August or September. And now we're going into October. And then a higher price in the first four months. And then, just like in the stock market, sell in May and go away. Now, let's talk about the past. I've got two slides here. This is cumulative world production and its distribution. You'll see back in 1500, not me, but somebody, estimated that maybe about 6 billion ounces of silver had been mined, mostly in Mexico. Peru, Bolivia, they weren't called Mexico, Peru, and Bolivia back then, but they were there. There was silver all over the world. Most of the silver that's been mined, we have an estimate of about 58 billion ounces of silver has been mined through history, and most of it since 1900, with, as Earl Bennett was talking about, the modernization of mining, mechanization of mining, chemical processing of ores, going back where people had picked the silver they could see out of veins, and, and then chemically treating the host rock and recovering silver. So most of it, about 58 minus 12, so about 46 billion mined in the last 120 years. Relatively easy to count. Our estimate is that about half of it is identifiable. About 25 billion ounces seems to have been lost to history. You have about 3 billion ounces, 3.3, 3.4 billion ounces in bullion about 2 billion ounces in coins, mostly bullion coins, uh, so about 5.4 billion ounces in silver, in the form of silver, another 26 billion in jewelry and tableware and silverware and statues and other things. Relatively identifiable. I have a 10-ounce Ganesh that the Bombay Bullion Association gave me the first time I spoke for them. It's sterling silver, has to be polished every so often. Uh, and it's 10 ounces, exactly. I know what it is. It's an investment to me. It was a god to them. And you put that all together, and you can see back in the 70s and 80s, we had an estimated 5 billion ounces in bullion form, not counting coins, right? It fell in the 90s, and then it fell further. 
Some of that actually was converted into coins. Those two billion ounces of silver coins didn't exist in 1980. They were made out of bullion after that. And there's still about 3.4 3 billion ounces of silver. So anybody who tells you that the world's running out of silver, you can go turn the channel. They don't know what they're talking about. Now, that said, a lot of the people who own this bullion aren't necessarily sellers at $22 an ounce today. The present. Silver, unlike gold, investors will buy and sell. My uncle bought a lot of silver back in the 60s when it was fixed by the US government at a dollar. Or a, in the 50s, it was 85 cents an ounce, then 88 cents an ounce, then a dollar, then a dollar 29, which was the melt value of coins. He bought a lot of silver then. And in the first quarter of 1980, right there, he sold it and bought a house with it. And the seller took silver at a price of $35 an ounce. My uncle waited five years and started buying silver again when the price got down to $8. That's a smart silver investor. Investors will buy silver when they think the price is low. When they think the price is falling, they'll sell it, which is what they did in the 70s. When they think it's going to rise, 79, 80, they buy a lot. As the 80s progressed, they bought progressively less. By 1990, they were sell net sellers. They were net sellers for 15 years. Earl talked earlier about your grandmother's silverware being melted down. There was something like 700 million ounces of silver scrap refining just 1979 to 1981, 1982. Silverware, silver jewelry, old coins, new coins. When people think the price is high and going to fall, they sell. When they think the price is low and not going to rise, they don't buy, which is what you saw in the 1990s. And then by 2005, they say, wait a second. If I wait a day to sell my silver, I might get a higher price, which is exactly the same logic back in 1979. And they've been net buyers, and you can see they bought a lot of silver 2009, 2010, 2013, and then 2000, um, let's see, this is 21, 20, 20, 19, 17, 18, 19, they bought significantly less. When they sell, the price doesn't rise. When they buy, the price rises. When they buy less, the price doesn't rise. When they buy more, the price rises. We saw last year investors buy more than twice as much silver as they did in 2019, with pretty good reasons. And the price rose sharply. We have an expectation that they're going to buy even more this year. And we think the price is going to rise. I'll show you my price projections in a little while. I think that's the future if it comes there. I, you know, when I said I wanted to come out here and talk, Partly because I love Shauna Hillman, and the silver summits were fabulous. And I want to see them revived at silver symposiums. And my colleagues said, why would you go there? Because you're going to be speaking with a lot of people who, A, say stupid things about you and CPM Group from a position of total ignorance. And they say stupid things about silver and about the state of the economy from a position of almost total ignorance. And I said, I'm not going out there to talk to them. I'm going out there to talk to investors, and I'm going out there to talk about the real silver market. And they said, OK, go if you're going to talk about the real silver market. Don't go if you're going to try to refute this nonsense, the fantasies. So I lied to them. Half of my presentation today is about the fantasies and why they're fantasies. But half of it's real. So bear with me. And if we uh, don't have time for questions. There'll be time tomorrow. SLVs rose sharply yesterday, last year, and we saw this enormous amount. But probably two thirds of this silver was not investors buying silver. Investors buy silver ETFs, and people use silver ETF purchases as a surrogate to measure unreported silver investment. And when the when the SEC was reviewing proposals to start ETFs in silver in 2006, 2007, we were advising them. And we said, one of the problems you're going to have 
is people are going to think that silver ETFs are a surrogate indicator of total investment demand for silver. And there'll be times when they're not. And it's okay, but that's not our job. Our job is to try to protect investors from feral marketeers, snake oil salesmen, bankers, brokers, and other people. That's why we hired Jack Kennedy's father to be the first SEC chairman, because he knew all of the tricks of the trade. Oh, that's not me. Last year, while investors were buying twice as much silver on a net basis as they had been buying the year before, other investors were selling silver. They were selling silver because they needed money, or because the price had risen sharply, or for whatever reasons. And the bullion banks in London, the market makers who stand there, when you have an account with a bullion bank and you call them up on your trading line, they have to give you a bid price and an ask price. And if you want to sell, they're going to buy at the bid. If, they, if you want to buy, they're going to sell it to you at the ask. And last year, there was an enormous amount of gold and silver sold by investors on a gross basis that backed up into bullion banks. Now, the funny thing is that if you go back a year, ah, I'm sorry, if you go back a year, you see this period of low purchases in silver, 17, 18, 19, and it also occurred in gold. At the same time, banks were getting bigger at, in, uh, regulations and oversight and investigations of banks was getting bigger, and there were a lot of penalties being paid for non-supervision of metals traders who had been manipulating the market by gunning the stops. And the bank senior management said, okay, we're paying all these penalties on gold and silver for these guys that we're not paying attention to. Let's get rid of our bullion department. So they started unwinding it, and Deutsche Bank got out of it, Barclays Bank got out of it, another other, uh, number of other banks scaled back, cut back half of their trading staff. And you saw banks getting out of gold and silver trading. And then the price started rising, but they were still market makers. And all of a sudden, they have all this gold and silver on their books. And their senior management comes and says, wait, I thought we told you to wind down your metals desk and you now have three, four, five times as much gold and silver on your books as you used to. It's all hedged, but you have increased the amount of bullion activity. They said, because we're still market makers and we have to buy and sell. Get rid of it. So what you saw last year was a big surge in silver ETF and gold <coughs> ETF purchases and sales, purchases by bullion banks. And what they were doing was the bullion desk was getting rid of their bullion, buying ETFs, which are shares. Those get transferred to the trading desk of the equity department. It's their problem now. The bullion desk has done its, its master's bidding and reduced its exposure to bullion. And then you started to see some of those ETFs sold off by the equity department. But it was the equity department's problem, not the bullion department. So when you see this big spike, Take two-thirds of it out. Investors bought a lot of silver ETFs last year, but probably about a third as much as it looks like. And this year, you can see they're still buying a lot more than they had been buying for several years. And it's a more level level. Coin sales are investors. Coin sales fell 17, 18, 19. They rose sharply in 2000. They were up 46% actually in 2019 from a very low level in 2018. They rose another 7% or 91, I'm sorry, they were down for the full year, 2019. They rose 91%, they almost doubled in 2020, even though coin uh, mints were having trouble producing. And they're off about 33% this year, but they're still very high, I'm sorry, ignore that bottom number. I keep telling my guys to take that out. On a year-to-date basis through July, they're up 57%. Investors are still buying a lot of coins, which is, for a lot of investors, our preferred medium. We like coins, bullion coins. Premia for the 100-ounce bar in green and the American Eagle, they shot up, representing that demand. And they've come off, then they shot back up, and then coming off again, but they're still very high. 
that tells you that investors are still buying gold and silver. And at 22, 23, 24, 25 dollars an ounce, they're buying more than when, they, when the price was 28 or 29, or 100, which I think it got to in April, if I understand the internet correctly. Let's talk about silver supply. Silver supply is held up well. The blue bars are mine production. You can see it fell for about four straight years. Uh, it fell sharply last year because a lot of mines were locked down for a period of time during the COVID. It's coming back up. It's actually higher this year in our projections than it was in 2019. And scrap actually is pretty high too. New mine capacity, the amount of capacity that's coming on stream has declined. And that is a cyclical factor reflecting the lower prices that we saw from 2013 through 2018, 2019, uh, and lower uh, investment in exploration and development. Over time, with prices at 22, 23, $28 an ounce or higher, you will see exploration and development pick up again, we assume, we expect, and you'll see this rise again to back where it was during the bull market. There are people who hold out the fact that the average grade of mined silver is falling as evidence that we're running out of silver. It's not. It's evidence that the price of silver is rising. Right? 2005, when the price of silver averaged $7 an ounce, the average grade was 13 uh, ounces per ton because you had to mine a higher grade to be profitable. And the value of that silver being mined, that ore being mined, was $94 a ton. As the price rose, miners could scale back their average grade, extend the, the useful life of their mine, maximize their long-term output. It's called good husbandry. And you saw that 13 go to 5.8, a 55% cut not because they're running out of ore, because the price is up 185%. And the value of the stuff is up 27%. So we're not running out. In 1988, we had 8 billion ounces of reserves. And we were mining about 800 million ounces a year. Right? In the intervening period, 1988 to 2008, we have mined 10 billion ounces. So 20% more than we had reserves at the beginning of that period. And at the end of that period, we have 16 billion ounces of reserves. Because we've explored, we've discovered, and because at a higher price, more of that stuff that we had found earlier that wasn't economic to be called reserves is economically mineable. So the world is not running out of silver to be mined. And I showed you the chart earlier. Silver's not, the world's not running out of silver above stock. But the cool thing is, that doesn't matter to the price on the short term. It does in a certain level. If you think about it, go back to that chart that I had with the above ground stocks. When the price went from $5 to $50, we had 5 billion ounces of bullion. Didn't stop the price from rising. It may have helped the price fall but in the aftermath, but it didn't stop the price from rising. And the same is true in gold and in other commodities. When the price is rising, people who hold bullion say, I'm going to wait to see how high it rises. When the price stops rising and it starts falling, some of them say, I'm going to sell, take my profits, lock in my profit. Other ones, I know a few, say, oh, well, I was once rich, and I'll be rich again when the price rises again. Besides, I heard on the internet that silver is going to $100. So I would have been a real fool to sell at $50 and put my money away. It's like, no, I won't go there. There's so many things to criticize in this world, especially in the world of gold and silver commentary on the internet and on this platform. Fabrication demand held up relatively well last year, but the increase this year is a little bit more shallow than we had expected. You can see the green stuff at the bottom is photography. It once was the largest use of silver. Now it's a very small use. The red stuff is jewelry and silverware. It is the largest use, but it's really five or six different industries. It's jewelry that we wear, it's silverware, it's quasi-investment silver, 
in South Asia, Southeast Asia, North Asia, the Middle East. We helped Chinese refiners and smelters sell something like 50 million ounces of silver into Saudi Arabia in the late 90s, early 80s. At a time when no one in the silver market would tell you that the Saudis wanted to buy silver. It's like, okay, yeah, they like silver. And a lot of that silver was then converted into jewelry because women can't own stuff that they can't wear in some rigid Islamic countries. So you make it into jewelry, it's wearable, that's the woman's retirement account, it's her protection against divorce, and if her husband gets killed, his wealth reverts to his family, not to her. So you see a lot of silver jewelry that's not really silver jewelry. It's insurance policies and stuff like that. The blue is electronics, all kinds of electronics. Uh, the yellow is other uses, because silver is used all over the place. Two specific areas that we've seen growth, solar panels. 20 years ago used nothing. Now it's up around almost 100 million ounces. And if you look at our projections, it's going up much more sharply over the next 10 years because solar panels growing. And you need that silver to generate electricity on a solar panel from sunlight. And silver use in autos, which has risen sharply, not because of electric vehicles, but because of all the electronic garbage that's being loaded into vehicles to distract the driver. I think the insurance companies are behind that. Record inventories. I talked about the disgorgement in Europe. London, record bullion. Now, they never reported uh, silver and gold at stocks until 2016, uh, trying to make the Bank for International Settlements and international banking regulators think that gold and silver are legitimate banking assets. They have started reporting it. And you can see it went from 950 billion to 1.6 billion, uh, 1.26 billion. So it's high. You have stocks in the COMEX at record levels. This only goes back to 88. Um, and Shanghai, which only started trading in 2012, very large inventories. So there's a lot of silver around. The future. These are our short-term price projections. In the next, this is, well, this is the silver price uh, through August 19th. And you can see. Yeah, it rose very sharply in, the, in August of last year. It came down. It went back up in the first quarter. It came back down, and now it's back down. Our expectation is that the silver price rises slowly but steadily over the next eight quarters. We have record silver prices in our long-term projections, but I don't show those for free at conferences. We sell those. We have record silver prices. And I will tell you that we're looking at a peak around $56 per ounce on an annual average basis within about five years. Probably not in the next two years, but when things get worse economically and financially, and we do think they will, we think investors will buy even more silver as they did in that period 2008 to 2012, and the price will rise. Then things will get better and the price will come down. because. One of the other things that you hear that's total nonsense over and over again is the world's going to collapse. The dollar's going to collapse. The treasury market's going to collapse. Oh, what else? You know, Everything's going to collapse. Well, you know what? For 500 years, it hasn't collapsed. We've run it flat out. We've put it away, tired, wet, and cold, but it comes back. We lost $7 trillion in the tech stock bust in 2000-2001. And we made it back. Then we lost $7 billion in the housing bubble, 2007, 2009. And we made it back. Then we lost $8 trillion last year, and we've made it back. That's how the real economy works. And you've got these guys out there. The dollar's going to collapse. And you know, I mean, Jeff, I love Jeff Clark, but you know, oh, the dollar fell 40% or 25% from 1976 to 1980. Yes, it did. And then from 1980 to 1985, it rose 60%. Yeah. And the dollar, for all of its weakness, isn't really collapsing. I'll show you some charts tomorrow uh, about that, if you're around. So those are our prices. Our view, we see us in a con uh, con consolidation phase for gold and silver, led, followed, not in 2022, but at some point in the near future, by 
renewed recession, re renewed financial problems, renewed worsened political problems, and sharp increases in gold and silver. So people keep asking me, do, was this the bull market, and are we now entering a bear market for gold? Was this the bull market, and are we now entering a bear market? And I say, no. This was the first leg of the bull market. This is a consolidation phase that might last for two years or so, and then it's going to rise. And why would you believe me? Because in 2009, we said we think the gold price and silver price will probably peak around 2010 or 2011, and then they'll probably fall for three to five years in a consolidation and profit-taking period, and then they're going to rise again in another leg. And they peaked in 2011, they fell from 2013 to 2019, and now they're rising again. Why? Not because we're part of some conspiracy that knows where it's going. And by the way, if it is a conspiracy to suppress silver prices, it's done a piss poor job. Second thing, we've done it because our analysis is accurate. Our analysis of the silver market, our analysis of the gold market, and the, our analysis of the world. People are trying to scare you to buy gold and silver based on fears, right? They're trying to get you to fantasize that gold and silver are going to rise the same way Carl Jung said people will go to absurd levels to fantasize that their lives are better than they are and to pay them a premium. All right, let's talk about silver trading. I got a whole lot. I probably don't have much time. This is COMEX. The chart is non-commercial, gross, long, and short positions. You can see investors have, and the black line is the net. The blue stuff is gross, long. Investors almost always are net, long, the COMEX. Because investors, generally speaking, want to buy, when they go to the COMEX, they're not looking to buy physical silver if they're smart. If you want to buy physical silver, you go buy physical silver. If you want to buy leveraged exposure to the price of silver, you go to the COMEX. And the leverages are great in mining shares, as, as Jeff said. But the leverage in COMEX futures is, is <laughs> puts that to shame. And the leverage in options just blows that away. So investors say, I want to buy leveraged exposure to silver or any other commodity. I'm going to buy futures or options. And most of them trade from the long side. It's weird, but most people Maybe it's not weird. Most people don't want to trade short. They have a problem, not only with gold and silver, but with stocks and with other things. People don't, aren't comfortable saying, I think that asset price is going to fall. Where I grew up, I'm used to things falling apart. So I said, no, no, no. I'm totally comfortable with the idea that something can fall. And I'm going to take my profits when the price rises. I'm going to take my profits when the price falls. Right? But investors, generally speaking, trade commodities long. For a long period in 1996 to 2013, there were very few investors who were willing to short silver. After 2013, as the silver price fell, there was a lot of investors who were willing to short silver on the COMEX, and most of that's gone. And investment demand still is very long on both a gross level and a net level. Now, futures are a zero-sum game. For every ounce that's bought, an ounce has to be sold. Who sells it? Oh, commercials. Who are commercials? They're merchants. They're futures commission merchants. Who are the largest futures commission merchants? The banks. Right? And if you think these guys are naked, 600 million ounces, you don't know banking. I'll get to that in a sec. Right? But even in the absence of the fact that they're hedging their physical long positions, they also are in the business of being market makers on the futures. And if all of these investors are saying, I want silver, I want to buy gold silver, I want to buy silver futures, I want to go long silver futures, somebody has to be willing to sell them that. And those are the commercials, by definition. They're in the business of selling when investors want to buy and buying when investors want to sell. Higher metal prices mean more profits for bullion banks because bullion banks are long. They're short the futures as a hedge of their long position. They're long. Now they're long, not, you know, bullion banks are not long 600 million ounces. Bullion banks are long maybe three times that. 
It's all secret. It's all corporate. No one really knows. But they're long because that's their job. And they buy silver from producers. And they finance it while the producers are having it smelted and refined. They finance the smelters and the refiners. They finance the fabricators who take those bars and convert it to grain. They finance it to the, the converters who take that grain and make it into plating salts. They finance the guys who take those plating salts and make strip. And then the guys who take that strip and make electronic uh, components. And the guys who buy that stuff and make it into semiconductors, and the guys who buy those semiconductors and make them into computers, and the guys who buy those computers and they, as wholesalers and sell them to retailers. They're financing this enormous chain of silver contained in various forms. And their credit department says, you must go home hedged every night. So if you can't hedge it in the forward market or the ETF market, or you use the futures market. So that short position is not a naked short position on the COMEX. And anyone who tells you it is just doesn't know what they're talking about. Or they know what they're talking about, and they purposefully are misleading you. There are some of those. The banks are long. And the guy who ran the scam, hey, let's bankrupt JP Morgan by buying silver, knew that full well. And he was paying people around Canada and the United States to say, oh, let's do this. If you look at it, banks make their money, and you guys know this because you do banking, most of you. you know, banks don't make their money by being long or short money. They make their money at 25 basis points of transaction, monthly checking account thing, checking verification charges, little bitsies. And the most profitable banks are the biggest ones because they can do this at a level that is just amazing compared to the smaller banks. When the price of silver in the first quarter of, of, of 2010, when the bankrupt JP Morgan thing started, the price was $17 an ounce. And if you're charging 3% interest for the metal that you're leasing out to all of those fabricators and to others, you're earning 51 cents an ounce on your leases. When you try to bankrupt JP Morgan, and in the third quarter, the price is now $38, they're making a buck 17, 129% more. Which is why in 2019, J.P. Morgan had record profits on its gold and silver trading. And the guy who did that, who knew this, was trying to get people to buy silver from him at premium prices. He knew he wouldn't bankrupt J.P. Morgan. He knew he could cause people to distrust JP Morgan and Scotia and HSBC because, wow, I run a bucket shop in Canada. And you, who can't you trust if you can't trust a bucket shop broker in Canada? This is, I'm not saying who it was, but this is the SLV price, the price of silver in the bullion market, and the PSLV. And you can't really see the difference between the SLV and the market price because they're right on top of each other. But you can see the difference between the price of silver, the price you paid if you wanted an SLV share, and the price of a PSLV. Another way to look at it, uh, this is the premium over the bullion price of uh, misspell, but it's there. You know, average premium of 12.9%, 9%. But spikes up to 15, 25% premiums. Let's bankrupt JP Morgan, and I'm going to become a billionaire on your back. Anybody who thinks that a broker makes money by buying and investing in stocks that he's selling doesn't understand that, no, he makes his money by selling those stocks. He might have options and free warrants that he's gotten from the company for touting his stocks, their stocks. Now, see the spikes. Difference between a researcher and a demagogue. A researcher looks at all of the data. Demagogues pick out what they want. Okay? Researchers say, hey, what's going on here? Researchers find similar patterns when prices rise as when they fall. Researchers delve into that. They look at the data that is behind the data, 
and they see there were thousands of independent investors and traders actually making purchases and sales. But they all are using the same price and the same price charts and the same computer models that say, hey, if the price falls below $25, sell. If the price rises above $26, buy. And some of them don't even have the computers telling them the computers just place the order. So increasingly, it's there. It's a very complex system. I'll show you some data. Demagogues, let's oversimplify this. Let's ignore the fact that a lot of times when the volume spikes, it's not someone trying to smash down the price. It's thousands of people looking at the same price chart saying it's time to buy or sell. You may be able to see this. At the bottom are the volumes. And you can see these enormous number of spikes. I'll show you the data in a second. This is the March contract in January. And you can see an enormous number of spikes. Some of them correspond with price, price, sharp declines in prices. Some of them correspond to sharp increases in prices. And some of them don't correspond to price moves. This is the same data in February. You can see back when some people were touting that silver was going to $100, you saw some big spikes, and those corresponded to this increase in price. And then they didn't correspond to this decrease, but they corresponded to this decrease. And you can see it, and then it trails off. In the last few days, there's virtually nothing, because people say, hey, this is nonsense. <laughs> yeah, this is just, oh, I already used one expletive. I won't use another. Um, this is the data. In those two months, there were 5,287 10-minute periods in which silver was traded. Of those 528, uh, 5,287 periods, 91% of them were in the first standard deviation. They were within, uh, they were less than 1,500 transactions of contracts traded in a 10-minute period. Now, let that sink in. 1,574 contracts traded in a 10-minute period, and that's the low end of the volume. That's an enormous volume. This is like, this is more than Walmart buys strawberries. This is big volume. And please understand, if the futures of market wasn't there, these guys wouldn't say, oh, I can't buy silver futures with a 10% down and, and have a leverage exposure to price, prices of silver on a short term basis. I have to buy physical metal and pay 5, 10, 15 percent uh, premium and then go through all the hassle of selling it. They wouldn't do that. They are there because of the convenience and the leverage of futures. They're not would be physical buyers. But go on and look at it. The second standard deviation, which is fewer than 2,500 contracts in a 10 minute period, 234. And everything else, 207 contra, uh, periods, representing 3.9%. And then we broke it down. We actually broke it down a lot more. This is a very simplified form. Five minutes? OK. Uh, this is a very simplified form. We broke it down so you could see where the volumes were. This is a period of sharply falling prices. And you can see, no one came in and traded 30,000 ounces in one lump sum. There were people who started buying, selling, and the price fell below uh, 26 uh, 60 and then there was uh, increased volume and then it fell for it rose uh, above 40 it didn't fall below 2640 so there was buying for two for 20 minutes of, of even bigger volumes and then it fell and then it was quiet then it fell and it got below 26 uh, when it fell below 26 there was this wave of selling you can see that on the downside you can see it on the downside. You can see it on the upside. You can see it when the price doesn't move, right? You can see it all over the place. And it's not just silver in January and February. This is stuff from last October, in 20, October 2013, the last time we had a wave of people trying to, to convince folks that there was some sort of grand conspiracy. And you can see just in October of 2013, there were seven periods of unusually large volumes on the COMEX gold contract, four of them were buying opportunities and three of them were selling opportunities. So no smash down. The majority of the time, people were looking for higher prices. So it's there. What the, that's what the data shows.
the data shows that that's the way the markets trade. Now, the demagogue will say, ah, oh, those scoundrels, they figured out how to mask their trading by making it look like normal trading. And the researchers says, no, because there's other data to support this that says, no, this is how markets trade. Conspiracy theories evaporate. Thank you for listening to me. I hope to see you around in the next few days. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>